before she comes out, why don't you all hold up your hold up your the new book or whichever book you have here. Give her a nice little Facebook Live greeting. That is awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> another another announcement. We are doing this on Facebook, and we actually have our own YouTube channel, which Patrick will transfer the Facebook broadcast to the YouTube channel, so you can do either one. If you're really cool, you can watch it on Facebook. I mean, you can go to our Facebook page and then post it to your Facebook page, and everybody will know you're here, right? Because social media is all about you, right? In your own in your own story. So we're trying to make it interesting. I've taken over Instagram, so there's a great picture of my puppy on there. So you can, you can enjoy that. And I, one more thing I forgot to mention, we are doing an event for Dracula tomorrow night with Leslie Klinger and another author at 6 o'clock, and we have Dracula treats and costumes, but I have all my pictures of Transylvania and all that I've just been to that we're going to show. So if you want to come at 6 o'clock, you can see Grand Castle the whole bit. And now I see our author, who is standing back there, and I'd like you to welcome Deborah Hartness back to the Poison Pen. It seems to me it'd be really fatuous of me to introduce her. Um, since clearly all of you are here. What she's doing. I will remind you that um, this year saw the publication of The World of All Souls and the Times, new Comfort. Book, Times Comfort, which is really a double blessing for all of you. And Deborah's going to do her own show and take over, so I'm just going to sit here and do crowd control. <laughs> I will give you the eye if you misbehave. <laughs> when we're done, um, we're going to ask you all to stand up because we have to get all the chairs out of the way. And then we're going to ask you to line up by number and a few people have inserted numbers that don't be crossed with them if they show up with an A or a B, it's because we screwed up. It's all yours. All right. I don't, you know, Barbara's also always so funny with the evil eye. You know, she's going to do the evil eye. She clearly, she clearly has forgotten that she's dealing with the university professor. And my evil eye is like a laser beam. But you guys look like a pretty well-behaved crowd. No one's taken out a newspaper yet, which is better than what happens in my classroom. So, first of all, thank you, Barbara, and everybody here at the Poison Pen for welcoming us once again. It's always such a treat to be here and to look out and look into the back of the room to see the last of the crowd. So don't worry, I will not forget that you're back there during the q and I'm going to talk for about 20 or 25 minutes, then I'm going to open it up for 20 or 25 minutes of your questions. But first I want to start with a quiz. <laughs> hands up if you have finished Times Convert. Keep your hands up if you've read it twice. <laughs> Put your hands up if you've read it three times. <laughs> All right, still pretty good. All right, now, hands up if you've only start your part way through, or you haven't even held the book in your hand yet, or you know you're just you're just starting out this journey. For times convert. For what did I say? Okay, okay. So the, keep your hands up. Now. Look how many people haven't even finished the book. So the pur purpose of this quiz is to remind you that the person next to you may not have finished the book. And therefore, during the Q&A period, uh, there will be no spoilers. Because, yeah, no. Because you're outnumbered, folks. Um, and so if you would just remember, well, let's listen. You, you know, I, what I'm saying here is, I don't know questions about how did you decide to do this in chapter 12, and it was so exciting at the end when. If you have to think for a split second, is this a spoiler? It is a spoiler. <laughs> so if you have such a question, you can always ask me in the signing line, but you're going to see me in a few minutes. It's not a big deal. Um, and um, But that's, I just want to sort of set that ground rule. And again, my my professor, Gimlet <laughs> Stair, um, will, will come after you. Um, Are you if, free on uh, other occasions? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is my own patented shtick. I only do it just occasionally. I'm really sorry, because you could do this so much. Yeah, yeah, well, there you go. It, uh, like I said, I te I've taught since 1994. It's been a long time. So, not my first rodeo. So, but I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have this book and not some other book in your hands today. Um, and that's because back in 2014 and 15, when I had finished the third book in the trilogy, The Book of Life, and was out on tour, 
you guys were all very, very kind to me. And when I said to you, this is it, this is the last installment in the story of Diana and Matthew in Ashmole 782, which is true, um, you all said, but we want more. And I said, uh-huh, well, okay, but this is really the end of the story. I said, but no, we, we really want more. <laughs> and so I went off after the end of the paperback tour, and I had two questions I needed to answer. One of them was, could I go back into this world in some other way, not to continue that story, which really was done in the Book of Life. And if I did go back, how was I going to go back? Now, it turned out that the answer to the first question was pretty straightforward. And that's because it was just at about the, that time, as I was wrapping up with Book of Life, that the television show switched into major development. And I was literally pulled right back into the world of Diana and Matthew and all their kith and kin. And not only just to the end of that, but to the very beginning of the story. So, you know, for me, I am a nonlinear thinker. What that means is I have a real trouble with um, outlining. I've never been able to outline anything, not a college paper, not a high school paper, not my dissertation, not either of my two academic books, not an article I've ever written and published. None of these books have ever been outlined, okay? And um, when I start to play with ideas, it tends to be very free form and playful for until I decide, you know, kind of like, what am I gonna do? And in the case, and then I, I sort of, um, in the case of, of Marcus and, and this book, Marcus was really sort of competing for my attention at the time that the TV show started with about five other stories I wanted to tell that have nothing to do with the All Souls world at all. A book about Matthew and a book about Galaglass. The book about Galaglass, it went right to the bottom of the line, and that is because I can't write about places I haven't been, and I have not, I had not at that point been to Ireland, Scotland, Norway, uh, Australia, or New Zealand. And I couldn't exactly just sort of drop everything and do that, because I was involved in some other stuff. And so that was immediately sort of put aside. I had already put the five other stories aside because I decided I was going to keep going with the All Souls World while I was working on the TV. So that left Matthew and Marcus. And at first, Matthew broke ahead, broke out of the pack. And I started working on a story about Matthew in the 16th century under Henry VIII and Mary Tudor and the early years of Elizabeth. And I named it The Serpent's Mirror. And then Matthew did something quite unexpected, which is, should not have surprised me, but it did. And that slowed to a crawl. When that happened, I had about 175 pages. And uh, I thought, oh gosh, I have to have a little think about this. And it was at that point that like Marcus just went streaking past in my peripheral vision. <laughs> and I started to work on Marcus instead. Nothing has happened to the Serpent's Mirror except it's on a very slow trajectory forward. So I had 175 pages in about 2016. I have about 225 pages now just going slow. But Marcus is done. So I could have done one of two things. I could have either stuck with my original plan and he'd still be waiting for Serpent's Mirror, or I could just wrap up with Marcus, which is what I decided to do. So how did I do that? Um, I am not a trained writer in terms of creative writing. I am a, I am a very well-trained historical writer and researcher, but I have never taken a creative writing class ever. When I started writing novels at 43, I had no idea what I'm doing, and I consider it to be, for me, a craft. What that means is that when you guys have asked me about my process before, I've always felt a little bit awkward about answering you. <laughs> because, like, what am I supposed to say? Well, I don't do outlines, and I've never been able to follow any of the steps on those really helpful Pinterest posts. <laughs> that, like, I just write a novel, and I look at them, and I immediately just freeze, because I think, okay, I do none of that. You're, you're nodding, you know what that's like. You're like, oh my God, I do none of that. So, so what do I do? Well, I get up every single morning and I make tea or coffee and I uh, write in a notebook for half an hour to one hour. And I write whatever comes into my head. And sometimes it is dialogue and sometimes it's a description of a character. Sometimes it's a description of a place. And sometimes, more likely than not, it is questions. I am a historian. I trade in questions. I know you guys think, oh, historians are those horrible people with answers. 
not true. We are the people who bring you questions. And the right question can unlock a universe of possibilities. But if you start with the wrong question, you are out of luck. You're just not going to find anything interesting. And so what often will happen is, is that I will start by thinking, hmm, which would Marcus prefer to spend time with? Alexander Hamilton or John Adams? <laughs> and then I will write until my coffee and tea runs out, just sort of freewheeling based on extremely limited information, I might add. Um, I'm like, well, there's that musical Hamilton. I should probably listen to that. And I don't know anything about that. Is Alec, I, is Alexander Hamilton the one who was in the duel? Turns out, no, that was Aaron Burr. Uh, you know, was Alexander Hamilton dead by the end of the war? Did he die in the war? And so I just will literally like question after question after question. Then I get dressed and I go downtown and I teach my classes where I have access to reference libraries and databases. And in between appointments and meetings, I look up answers to my questions. And like sometimes I'll have imagined really ridiculous things because the person is actually dead <laughs> when I'm writing about or whatever. And I kind of fill in little answers and write on the sides. And all of those answers that I find inform then what I write the next morning. Because then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, definitely he'd like, he wouldn't like either one of them. That was the answer to the John Adams and, and Alexander Hamilton question. Um, and who would he like? You know, okay, well, what if, I wonder, what, would he be more drawn to women? Would he have more women friends than men friends? That, spent, uh, that question led me to about a month and a half of reading books about friendship in, in the 18th century. So I end up in this kind of research and development loop. I don't do all the research and then the writing. I also don't do all the writing and then fact check that with the research. It's a very organic process that takes me in a whole lot of different directions. And at some point during that whole R&D phase, I usually have an aha moment. And what that aha moment does is it answers my second question. If you think back to the very beginning, I said to you, I have two questions. Did I want to go and could I go back into this world? And if I did, <coughs> how was I going to do it? It's the how you're gonna do it that is the challenge, at least for me as a writer. Not the like, you know, dream up 100 story ideas. I can do that really easily, but I can't crack them. It's like a nut that you can't crack. Um, and what happens in my little rough research and writing loop is I figure out a way to crack the nut open. In the case of this book, it came when I read Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Now, I don't know how many of you have read Common Sense lately. Um, I, I, I was, uh, have you? Yeah. Okay. I school good. English teacher. Good for you, okay. So, but I think that is the last time I read any of it, was in high yeah, school. Probably. And I don't think I retained much of it. Um, and so when I went back to read it at 52, I was astonished by it in a way that I'm confident my 17 year 16 year old self was not. And what struck me about Common Sense was um, a few things I had forgotten. It was first a newspaper column, mm -hmm. and it was published in serial format in a newspaper. So people were like rushing off to get the new newspaper so they could read the next chapter of this, of this work. Mm -hmm. Payne wanted a far more radical revolution than the one that was brokered in our American Revolution. He wanted more equality, he wanted more economic equality, racial equality, gender equality, things that were really just not going to happen in the context of an, a revolution that not only needed to defeat an empire, far, a king far away, but also needed to unite 13 very different colonies. I, uh, again, sort of kind of knew, but didn't really, that the colonies were really, really not on the same page during the early years of the war. What, and what, what struck me was not like the ideological differences, it was the fact that when the army went into battle, the soldiers from Connecticut would not sleep in the same barrack as the soldiers from South Carolina. And the South Carolina soldiers would not see a doctor who was from Virginia. And nobody in Massachusetts would listen to a commander who was from Rhode Island because they were all colonial militia. And so bringing all those forces together was a really challenging thing. So that really surprised me um, at the, the kind of 
ways in which pain was was trying to bring people together for a common cause, and it turns out people weren't interested in that common cause in the same way. The other thing that really struck me forcefully was that pain used the language of family <coughs> to talk about revolution. Family. He likened the revolution to a family fight in which the bad father, <laughs> i.e. the king, was not allowing his children to grow up and be fully independent, which was their God-given right to determine the, their future, to self-govern, to self-regulate. And so he used very, very uh, thickly the language of the bad father, the rights of the children, the rights of um, what, what, what a good family relationship would look like. Now, People who really ran with this argument were actually not the Americans, but the French and the French Revolution. They loved Paine, and they liked his more radical ideas. And they went so far that they actually got rid of the father entirely <laughs> um, with the guillotine. We did not do that, but nevertheless, what was on the minds of a lot of people, weirdly enough, in the American Revolution were family politics and family relationships. And that was when I went, oh. Know how to tell Marcus's story. Because one of the things I knew about Marcus from the very get go was I thought, what? You know, remember all my questions? What would a dinner conversation be like between Matthew, Mr. Patriarch, Mr. Don't Question Me, Mr. I'm a man of faith, who was born at a time when to question authority was to literally put yourself at risk for being destroyed? Um, in the fifth, you know, sixth century A.D., what would their conversation be like between that father figure and a son who was born in the age of reason, in the age of rebellion, at a time when people were saying, "So what? You're my father. If you don't treat me like an independent grown-up, I don't have to pay attention to you." I didn't imagine that it would go really well. <laughs> but at the time that I wrote that question down, I thought, "Well, yeah, I'll think about that later." Thomas Paine's book, *Common Sense*. His pamphlet brought all that back to me. And I thought, now I know how to tell it. This story, Times Convert, is really a story about families. And it's a family about, it's a story about growing up. And it's a story about independence. And once I figured that out, I knew that it wasn't just going to be Marcus's story. It was going to be three braided stories. The first one was going to touch, it, you know, sort of touch in. Um, get, get in touch with Diana and Matthew and their twins and their four-legged friends and their relatives about one year after the events of the Book of Life. And that's because they have a pretty interesting family. <laughs> and about a year after the Book of Life puts the twins at the ripe old age of 18 months, which, as any parent knows, are not the most tranquil months <laughs> of a child's life. As, especially not with twins entering the terrible twos. Especially not if you're a control freak. Well, I don't know if you are, but like Diana and Matthew, a little bit. Okay, so can you, I mean, Matthew, Diana, and twins entering the terrible twos. That seemed like an interesting family rebellion story to me, right? I also thought, aha, there's somebody else who's going to go through their own struggles to grow up and be independent, and that's Phoebe. Because if you remember, at the end of the Book of Life, what we knew was that Marcus and Phoebe had decided to have a traditional vampire relationship, which meant she needed to go from being a warm blood to a vampire. And so I thought, yeah, we'll chuck that in. That'll be the second storyline. And I, I uh, decided that the first 90 days of a vampire's existence was their infancy, for lack of a better term. I had a newspaper interviewer ask me, you know, which vampire story told you that it was 90 days? <laughs> I said, uh, none. Um, I said, and they said, what did you read? I said, what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> I read books about pregnancy, childhood, growing up, adolescence, um, turning 21, midlife crises, menopause, old age because what I decided was that a vampire's 90 days 
would sort of mirror a human's 90 years, except that every day they would go through the challenges a human would in that year. So then I got to think about what would the terrible twos look like for a vampire? What would puberty look like for a vampire? What would 21 look like for a vampire? And so we spend summer with Diana and Matthew and the twins in this, in their, at their home at Les Revenants, and we spend that same 90-day period watching Phoebe in faraway Paris undergoing her change into a vampire. Why did I put her in Paris? Well, because when I was reading all of those childhood development books, and I read them not just for our period, but one of the things that fascinated me was they were obsessed with raising good children in the 18th century and in the Renaissance, and all the way back in time. We think we're just so progressive because we really care a lot about how to raise our children. This is not new. And so when I had been reading these books, I was reminded that there was uh, a ceremony. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the, of the ritual of churching women, where when a woman had given birth to a child, she was kept away from the rest of the community for a period of time. It was not usually as long as 90 days. But I thought, oh, I'm going to steal that. Let's say that traditionally vampires were kind of kept in seclusion during that infancy so that they could be trained and monitored and watched and checked, and that it was only after they went through that 90 days successfully that they became a fledgling vampire, sort of able to take care of themselves. And what that would mean was that Phoebe and Marcus couldn't be together over the summer. Instead, Marcus would be back home with dear old dad, telling him to calm down, and his new stepmother, and these two little, ha these two little twins, um, worrying about his mate. And if I were Marcus and I was kept away from somebody I love for 90 days while they were going through a really rough time, I know what I would be doing. It would bring back a whole lot of memories of my own experiences. And that's what provides the third strand in the story is Marcus thinking about what Phoebe's going through, remembering what he went through back in the 18th century when he undertook this, this journey and about the things that he had to learn and experience for the first time and adjust to. And that's how we end up with Time's Convert, with this sort of really three-part story. It's not just about Marcus's um, experiences becoming a vampire, but Phoebe's, and it's also about Matthew and Diana's experiences of how, learning how to be a good parent, which, you know, I know it's hard to be, grow up and go through all these changes, but I think parents have just as many struggles trying to figure out what am I supposed to do now? I never imagined they were gonna do that. Now what do I do? Uh, so it's not, not an easy thing to be a parent. So that's how we ended up with this book, not some other book, and with this book that takes this very particular form. And I just wanted to give, read a little bit from chapter nine of the book. Uh, it is a chapter, I, I know I said you know, no spoilers, no spoilers, but here's the good part. What happens in chapter nine you already know about if you read A Discovery of Witches, because what you know is about Marcus's uh, experiences at the Battle of Bunker Hill. When he learned how to set a leg, a broken leg, and he learned it from one of Sarah Bishop's ancestors. So just to give you a sense of how Marcus's recollections uh, function and what it's like to be immersed in the 18th century, I'm just gonna read you um, a little bit from that. First, I have to find it, so just a second while I put down my, my hook on. All right, here we go. The rest of the Battle of Bunker Hill passed in a blur of blood, buckshot, and chaos. There was no water, no food, and little respite from the fighting. Stark and his men turned the British aside. They turned them aside again. When the British attacked a third time, the exhausted colonists had no ammunition to fight back. The hardiest and the oldest men volunteered to stand at the wall while the rest retreated. They were almost across the neck and safely back in Cambridge when Jimmy Hutchinson suddenly fell, a piece of shot embedded in his neck. Blood spatters mixed with the freckles on the boy's face. Am I gonna die? <coughs> Jimmy's voice was faint. Not today, Marcus said. If it gave Jimmy a shred of hope to cling to, though Marcus knew the boy would curse fate before his ordeal was over, how could it hurt? Marcus took a coat from a dead British soldier. 
He and Aaron Lyon made a makeshift stretcher out of it. Together they carried Jimmy toward the camp hospital that had been set up in Harvard Yard. The area smelled like a charnel house, the scent of blood and singed flesh filling the air. It sounded even worse. Groans and pleas for water were punctuated by screams of soldiers in agony. Bless me, is that Jimmy Hutchinson? A stout woman, fiery headed with a pipe clamped between her tweet teeth, appeared out of the smoky twilight, barring their way. Mistress Bishop, Jimmy said weakly, blinking up at her. Is that you, ma'am? Who else, Mistress Bishop replied. What fool let you come up here and get yourself shot? You're not even 15. Ma doesn't know, Jimmy confessed, his eyes rolling shut. I should think not. You should have stayed in Salem where you belong. Mistress Bishop gestured to Marcus. Don't just stand there, bring him here. Here was not the direction that most of the wounded were being carried. Here was a small fire with a group of makeshift beds arranged around it. Here all was quiet, as opposed to there were shouts and cries and utter bedlam pronounced, uh, proclaimed the location of the surgeons. Marcus eyed the woman with suspicion. Well, you can take him to Dr. Warren if you want to, but Jimmy's chances of surviving, they're better with me. Mistress Bishop shifted her pipe from the left side of her mouth to the right. We left Dr. Warren on Breed's Hill, Marcus said, pleased to show up the woman as a liar. <laughs> Not that Dr. Warren, you dolt, the other one. Mistress Bishop was equally delighted to let Marcus know he was a conceited fool. <laughs> I reckon I'm more familiar with the medical men of Boston than you are. I want to stay with Mistress Bishop, Jimmy mumbled. She's a healer. Well, that's a polite term for it, Jimmy, Mistress Bishop said. Now, are you two louts going to carry my patient to the fire, or do I have to do it? He's got a piece of shot in his neck, Marcus hurriedly explained as they lugged Jimmy the last few yards. I think it cut through the veins, but it could be lodged in the artery. Some of the flesh around it is black, but that could just be a burn. I tied my sleeve around it really tight. As so I see, Mistress Bishop said. She picked up a pair of nips, a rushlight pinch between them. She peered into the wound. And what's your name? Marcus McNeil. Marcus fished around in his pocket and pulled out a bit of candle wood he brought from home. The resinous pine splinter would cast a bre brighter glow than the flickering rushlight. He thrust the end of it in the flame. The wood caught immediately. Thank you. Mistress Bishop swapped her nips for the candlewood. You know your way around a body. Are you one of those Harvard boys? <laughs> her look of derision was reason enough to deny it. Mistress Bishop clearly had no use for the college educated. Oh, no, ma'am. Hadley, Marcus replied, his eyes pinned to Jimmy's pallid face and blue-tinged lips. I don't, I don't think he's getting enough air. Oh, none of us are, not with all this smoke, Mistress Bishop said. She contributed to it by drawing on her pipe and sighed, a fug of tobacco surrounding her, and looked. she looked down at Jimmy. No matter, he'll sleep a bit now. Marcus knew better than to ask whether Jimmy would wake up. It took me 18 hours to bring that boy into the world, and no time at all for some idiot with a gun to steal him away. Mistress Bishop pulled a small bottle out of her pocket. War is such a waste of women's time. <laughs> Mistress Bishop used her teeth to pull the cork from the bottle and spat it into the fire. It popped and sizzled for a moment before igniting in the flames. She took a swig and offered it to Marcus. Thank you, no, Marcus said. He still felt as though his stomach could rise up at any moment. Memories of the battle struggled to the surface of his mind. He had killed a man. Somewhere in England, a mother was waking up without a son, and it was his fault. You think about that weeping mother before you pull the trigger next time, Mr. Bishop said, returning the flask to her own lips. Somehow, this woman had divined the contents of Marcus's guilty conscience. Alarmed and overwhelmed, Marcus clapped a hand over his mouth as his guts heaved. Mistress Bishop looked at him sharply, her hazel eyes snapping. Don't you dare go all missish on me. I haven't got time for your nonsense. One of the Proctor boys broke his leg, running away from the guns. Fell in a hole. First sensible story of battle I've heard today. <laughs> Mistress Bishop took another swig from the bottle, then lumbered to her feet. 
She beckoned for Marcus to follow. Marcus remained where he was until his innards returned to their natural place. It took rather longer than the red-headed healer found acceptable. Well, she demanded, standing over a prone soldier whose eyes were bugged out from pain and fear. Are you gonna faint or are you gonna help me? I've never said a broken leg. Marcus felt that honesty was the best policy with Mistress Bishop. You've never killed a man either, first time for everything, Mistress Bishop said. Besides, I'm not asking you to set it. You're gonna hold him down while I do it. Marcus stood at the man's head. No, not there. Bishop's patient had been spent. Hold his hip here and his thigh there. She placed Marcus's hands in the right position. Do you have anything to drink, Sarah? The man croaked. Marcus thought a drink was a very good idea based on the angle of the soldier's ankle relative to his knee. She slapped her fat flask into Marcus's palm. You have a sip first, then give John a swig. You've gone all green again. <laughs> this time, Marcus accepted her offer. The liquid burned a path down his throat. He held the bottle to the soldier's lips. Thank you, the man whispered. You got anything else for the pain, Sarah? Anything stronger, I mean? A long look passed between the soldier and the healer. Sarah shook her head. Not here, John Proctor. It was worth asking, Proctor sighed and laid back. You ready, McNeil? Sarah clamped her pipe between her teeth. Before Marcus could respond, or indeed even fully understand the question, Sarah Bishop had pulled the bones back into place, the muscles in her arms rigid with effort. Proctor howled in agony, then passed out from the shock. There, there, all done. Sarah patted Proctor's leg. Not shy with their feelings, the Proctors. <laughs> Marcus thought the patient had been remarkably composed considering the seriousness of the injury, but he held his tongue. Sarah pointed back at the flask. Have some more of that. And the next time you set a bone, remember to do it just like I did. Immobilize the limb, then put your back into one good tug. You'll do less harm that way. There's no point in being so timid with the bones you shred the muscles to pieces. Yes, ma'am. It had been difficult for Mar Marcus to obey Colonel Woodbridge's orders, but Sarah Bishop was another matter. I've got more men to treat. Sarah's pipe had gone out, but she kept chewing on it anyway, as though it gave her comfort. Should I stay and help, Marcus asked. No, go back to Hadley, Sarah replied. But the fighting, it's not over. There are ways to serve the cause of liberty that don't involve bloodshed, Sarah replied. The army is gonna require surgeons far more than soldiers. She pointed the end of her pipe at him. Her eyes were dark, the pupils huge. Marcus shivered at the sight. It must have been the drink and the smoke that made her look so strange. Your time has not yet come, she continued, her voice dropping to a whisper. <coughs> Until it does, Go home where you belong, Marcus McNeil. Be ready. When the future beckons, you'll know it. So back in 2014 and 15, when you were all telling me you just wanted more, 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 it didn't matter, just wanted more. Um, I, took, I took enough time that I felt like I could really could figure out not just again sort of what to not only to discuss decide what more i wanted to give you but how i wanted that to go it took a couple of years i just want to thank everybody for their patience and for giving me that time to figure it out because i never want to give you just more i always want to give you something that you can chew on and think about and something that stays with you a little bit longer than that um, that was true, I hope, for the trilogy. Some of you may have bought it because it was a forbidden love story and, you know, involved alchemy and a witch and a vampire, and fair enough, that's what it said on the back cover. But really, it was about, you know, the importance of change and the power of empathy and how crucial diversity is to our survival and what price we pay when we try to get rid of that. And this book is no different from that. Um, this is a story about how sometimes the most heroic things we do are not to slay dragons or fight our enemies uh, at home or abroad, but the simple acts of taking care of the people around us, whether we're parents, whether we are taking care of the elderly, 
or we're librarians or teachers or doctors, doesn't matter who we are, um, that we are sometimes at our very best when we're thinking about other people. So I will give you more, but first I have to figure out not just what I want to say, but how I want to say it. And when I do, I'll be back here, poison pen, if Barbara will have me, um, and sharing it with you again. So thanks for being such a wonderful audience, and we've got time for questions. So let's get to it. And again, being the, being the teacher that I am, I am happy to field questions. As long as they're not spoilers. Anybody got any? Yes, right back here. Okay, so I have read and I'm in love, but my true love will be Shadow of Night. That's just, that's my baby. Um, is there any chance or any hope of going back to the School of Night crew and kind of their? Probably not. Um, or not, not in the way you would probably expect, and there's two reasons for that. One, I just think time walking is hard, um, and the other reason is because we've already sort of done that, and they were there for such a limited period of time, and I don't think even the story of Matthew in the 16th century will bump up too far into that whole circle of friends, so probably not. Um, uh, we'll have to just sort of see, but I, I try to imagine, and uh, I can't think of a good reason to go back there other than sheer entertainment value. So I will say that you have made me hunt for beyond amounts of fiction on those people, and it doesn't exist. Like, like it's it's so hard to find, you know, stories in relation to them as a. I know I that's why I wrote Shadow of Night, and it, it it makes you want more. I know. <laughs> well, that, it was that sense of, you know, I wrote my master's thesis on George Chapman's poem, The Shadow of Night, and it was the fact that I couldn't find anything out about those, that crew, um, you know, that bugged me for, you know, all the way from 1990 to 2008 when I started to write the books. Um, it was always the mysteries of that group of friends that, you know, tugged at me intellectually, but as a historian, I couldn't find enough to write a history book about. I could find enough to write a, a novel, though. So that's where that went. It would be great. We appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. I saw another hand up over here. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm really enjoying reading it. Obviously, I'm not done yet. But I really enjoyed the scenes with the twins. Mm -hmm. And it's prompted me to ask you, are you planning or hopefully planning a book just about the twins? <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the twins exist in isolation to everybody else around them, and they're pretty small. So I think that we have a little bit of train track to lay down first. Um, so we might end up uh, seeing them, uh, you know, I call this a prequely sequely book because it's called, it tells you the backstory of Marcus, but also kind of pushes the storyline forward gently, ever so gently. And I think we probably have a few more of those to get through before we the twins will be of sufficient verbal ability that a book could be entirely about them. For their future. Well, right, except that, you know, again, if we do that, we'll miss a whole lot of interesting stuff. True. So I, that's the balance I've got. That's that how part again. It gets you every single time, but we'll figure it out eventually. To, yeah, back here. I'm really curious how He doesn't know many historians of science. <laughs> no, he only talks about you know, the big ones. Uh, so, um, but where did you, like, how, do you have one resource that you go to, or have you just, is it just in your research that you? So I'm a his, I am a historian of science. I teach the history of science. I teach mostly early modern history of science with a little bit of medieval and a little bit of modern sometimes. Um, but as a historian of science, I have to keep pretty current on science and scientific ideas. I will tell you, I, I failed calculus. So I have a really hard time with post-Newtonian physics and anything that involves calculus. But Newton himself wrote the Principia in the language of geometry, so I'm really, I can actually do it, it just takes me longer. 
But as a historian of science, I really do have to kind of know what people are talking about and what the connection is of those ideas to other ideas, in part because my students know, right? So my students will come in as modern chemists, bio, biologists, physicists, and if I'm talking about somebody who lived in the 16th century, what I most want to do is make them understand that actually they are asking fundamentally similar questions. We're back to the questions again. The only thing that's different is how they answer them and what they think is is unacceptable. So I just try to collapse the distance they may feel to somebody like Johannes Kepler or Nicholas Copernicus who was wrong in terms of today's science, but who asked all the right questions. It's just that they didn't have the kind of ability to answer them the right way. So I'm just constantly trying to make those connections through time and that's, that's why it's in there. So yeah, I don't have one source. Um, I do a lot of reading. Even as a historian, I get lots and lots and lots of um, <laughs> invitations to replace my lab laboratory furniture, to you know, having problems with your gels. You know, no, not really, because I'm not a practicing scientist. But I read enough literature that they think I am, and that's always a good sign for me. So well, kind of a lot. Thank you. Well, and it, it really mattered to me, you know, that the science be as authentic and real as the history parts. Um, I didn't want it to be out of whack in that way. And so it was just a, a real important thing for me. And I've had moments of quiet triumph, like when they discovered that the Neanderthal DNA was really still in us, and when they discovered that really all the unanswered questions were in the dunk, junk DNA, just like Marcus suggested. So there have been real high points in my <laughs> theoretical <laughs> suggestions of what was going on. So thank you. Other questions? Yeah, in the back, in the gray. Yep. Um, I'm wondering what kinds of questions you're actually writing about today. What seem to be the key to the whole thing for you? Today's question is what is technically the difference between having ghosts and being haunted? <laughs> Seriously, that, I don't know yet. I'll figure it out. Um, but that, so that's like just an example of one thing. So I just, I mean, totally random, but literally that was what I was writing about. Okay. All right, I can, all I can see is a hand, a valiant, yes, waving at me. There you go. What you want to know? <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, oh, we have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> um, the, the first season, we wrapped filming in February. It's been cast, it's been shot, it's been edited, it's been wrapped, and there episode six of the series shows in England this Friday of eight. And it's coming to us on January the 17th. Uh, it's one giant lump. So if anybody wants to take the day off, the 17th of January, the 18th of January, would be your way to do it. Um, okay, and the, and the, the people who bought it are, the Sun, are Sundance Now and Shudder, which are the streaming platforms for AMC who would like very much to do an end run around Netflix and Hulu and your other providers. Everybody who now is in TV wants a streaming platform and a show like The Handmaid's Tale. We are Sundances in, in the way that, you know, like I don't know how many of you had Hulu before or you had cheap Hulu before Handmaid's Tale, right? So that's, everybody now wants it, and Sundance was very kind enough to allow us to tell a character-driven story without more blood, without more sex, and without more violence, which was important to me. And so they are our US partners. Um, and there will be, literally, you will be unable to move in any direction without knowing that on January 17th for the sum of $6.99, you can have access to all eight episodes of The Discovery of Witches. Uh, in okay, now, there was another frantic hand in the middle of the room in a white shirt. Yes? Okay, so that's it. So what, and the great thing about Sundance and AMC is because it's a whole bunch of link stations, after they stream it on Sundance Now and Shutter at a time they have not told me, um, it will actually be on the Sundance channel, which is in a lot of people's basic cable. And, you know, we're just going to kind of roll with that. 
So that's that's where we are at the moment um, with that. Yeah. So she's there any content on So the question is, is there any talk about season two? Um, there's talk about season two, but no one has actually written a check for season two. <laughs> so until somebody writes the check, it's all just talk. Now, talk, 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 talk. And then somebody will write a check, and then it will be greenlit. So if you hear the word season two has been greenlit, that's different than saying pencil it in for March, or we're really hoping to, or we're talking about scripts, all of which people can do without a dime being spent. <laughs> uh, so what you want is the... The money. The money. Absolutely. Yeah. So season one is just a discovery of witches. That one book. The season one is eight episodes and it's just a discovery of witches. It goes from the beginning of the book till the end of the book. And we are project we're hoping in our little conversations, yak, 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 that season two will be Shadow of Night. So we'll see if that happens or you know and it's eight episodes for season one and I don't know how many episodes it would end up being for season two the same probably or maybe a little bit more. Eighty did you just say eighty? Oh my goodness. Yes. I would did you have a say in picking the actors and actresses? Yes. Or you did? Well you picked great. So. Thank you. So yeah, to go back to the initial question, some of the actors and actresses in the show are uh, Matthew Good. Um, who plays Matthew Claremont, uh, Teresa Palmer, who plays Diana Bishop, Alex Kingston plays Sarah Bishop, Ooh. Valerie Pettiford plays Emily Mather, Louise Greeley from Sherlock plays Julian Chamberlain, Owen Teal from Game of Thrones plays Peter Knox, um, uh, an English, very well-known English actor named Trevor Eve plays Gerbert, uh, I'm trying to think of it. There's just, there's, it's a real, Isabel was Lindsay Duncan, the great Lindsay Duncan. Um, and it's pretty phenomenal. Um, it's an amazing, amazing cast of super talented actors. So um, for that, we are eternally grateful. Yes? I think I saw years back that you did a tour and took some people around the, the locations. Is there a tour now? like an actual tour in Oxford yeah. that you can take? Not to my knowledge, but they have added more tours to the Bodleian. <laughs> the librarian at the Bodleian is extremely happy with fans of Discovery <laughs> Witches um, because of the amount of tours they, they can give to paying customers. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I don't know of any in Oxford itself. If they are, I don't know about them. So maybe somebody else in the audience does. So. Yes, back here. Uh, on television, certainly. Um, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's still there. Just kind of hanging out. We were just in France this summer, so we'll, we'll probably end up back in the Bishop House at some point. Anybody? Should we sign some books? Oh, wait, Barbara has a question. We can answer Barbara's question. Yes. Well, and it's probably too big a question to answer, but it was something I've been thinking about. Because this is October, yeah. and because there's a lot of books about vampires and other things coming out, and I have been immersed in them since that's my job, my question is, your vision of, of being a vampire is unique to you mm -hmm. as compared to, say, Dracul or mm -hmm. Bram Stoker or Anne Rice or something. What what prompted you to go in the direction that you did creating mm -hmm. your vampires? Because they're really fascinating and they're they're good rather than the, the you know the, the evil kind that we associate with Dracula. Okay, so um, here's I know a, it's a big question. No, it's it's, it's actually fair. an incredibly easy question actually because I've never read Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I am going to the Bram Stoker Festival on the 27th, and I'm going to have to read Dracula on the plane because I've never read it. <laughs> Even more interesting, I just read three different versions of his life because what, what's actually being written at the moment is not Dracula, but rather Bram Stoker and trying to make him Dracula. Mm -hmm. And since I just went right. to Bram Castle in Transylvania and discovered it was in 1976 that anyone thought that he'd ever been there, Bram Stoker, because he never was there. Um, it's been fascinating in, in just a short period how he's become the more interesting character, <laughs> character than Dracula. Right, and so for me, I'm not, I was never all that interested in vampires. I never found them all that plausible. Um, and one of the things that I wanted was for all of these, these creatures to be plausible, which is why, you know, 
I don't meet a, a whole lot of people in my daily life who are 100% evil and have blood dripping from their mouths, etc. <laughs> so for me, it was like, well, if they really exist, I, they have to fit into my world. And so do demons, and so so did witches. It was easier with witches because witches have always been part of the world. It's one of the world's, you know, major religions, and when and there have always been kind of ways for communities to think about, okay, and of course we have witches among us, and how do we feel about that? Vampires have come really late to the party for me as a historian. There really wasn't a, an idea about vampires until the uh, 17th and 18th century, which again, like for me, is very late to the party, sorry. Um, demons go back as old as witches, and so I was just kind of interested in putting together, that's why I don't have a lot of these, you know, a lot of other supernatural creatures. I went with ones that, to go back to this lady's question, that could somehow, I could come up with a plausible scientific explanation for. Um, and and so that was really, just really, really important to me. To, 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 to um, you know, human beings make monsters. Um, and so I'm fascinated by that and by why we need to do that and how we do that. And I just wanted to sort of, to use a, 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 a silly word given the context, um, I wanted to stop demonizing them. <laughs> well, I mean, the idea of a beneficent vampire is a really interesting one. Um, I don't know that they're necessarily beneficent, but they're not, they're not Dracula, they're not harmful. Right, so, so one, I mean, you know, I think, I think a regular old human being can be as harmful as Dracula. I don't think you need to be a vampire to be harmful. But um, I do well, think well, that, um, that there's a kind of way in which, uh, again, that, that kind of that, that monster making impulse we have is to take somebody who we don't understand, we don't like, we don't like what they do, and then make them <laughs> radically other in some way. So that we can, you know, and so as a historian, um, I just like to fight that impulse because I think we, we demonize what we don't fully understand sometimes and that that's a really, important muscle that we need to use more often and um yeah so and who, who's who's you know I, I think who doesn't like a sexy 1500 year old <laughs> <laughs> oh when you read about so i remember to turn my mic on sorry about that um when you read about phoebe's transformation i think my question will have some greater relevance than for those of you who haven't Finish that. Now, before we sign books, it is our um, our hope most of the time to give you a little reward for coming. In addition to the joy of meeting Deborah and getting your book signed, we try to give a book away. So I found one here called *The Winter Soldier* by Daniel Mason, who wrote, um, is a very interesting writer. And we are going to use the numbers so that Deborah can pick. So what what do we have, PK, up there? One through 81, and you have to be present to win. My husband says that I'm going to be arrested for doing a lottery illegally. But yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we came in and put our stuff down and we didn't get numbers. I, didn't get I don't have a number either. Oh. Well, you have to have bought a book from us to get a number. That's the reason. Sorry, I should have made that very clear, right? It's not an all-purpose raffle. <laughs> um, in any case, um, would you like to pick a number between one and 81? And yes. give that away? 76. Oh, doesn't relate to Hadley, Massachusetts, or Marcus at all. Is that 76 in the row? Okay, perfect. see me, and we will, we will continue to work. Thank you. So um, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to stand up. Um, it, 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 it might be more comfortable if you just step outside into the parking lot for a minute. We're gonna get the chairs out of the way so nobody gets hurt. And then right up here, we're gonna start with